Uh, hello and uh, welcome. Thank you for joining this Hashi talk on automated infrastructure as code testing with Terraform, AWS, and Python. Uh, first, a little bit about me, your speaker, before we begin. Uh, my name is Bjorn Olsen, and I'm the head of data engineering at uh, cloudandthings.io. We are based in Cape Town. As you can see from the slide, I am passionate about big data, software development, the cloud, and things. Um, I've worked in the data space for over 10 years, primarily designing and developing big data solutions, both on-premise and in AWS cloud, with a focus on data lakes. I may seem like a data guy, but I've had the opportunity to work with Terraform for the last five years or so, so I'm familiar with some of the challenges around infrastructure as code, particularly um, how and why might we want to test infrastructure. I think most engineers would say that testing is important, but often we don't do enough of it. Let's therefore start our discussion by considering some motivation for implementing tests. Now, there are many reasons for testing and many things that you may want to test. Here I put down some guidance. Um, what do I think are some of the main reasons to write tests? This will help us decide what to focus our limited resources on when we write our tests. Primarily, we want to produce high quality code. There are many dimensions to quality, so let's talk about some that I think are important. Firstly, is our customer or user satisfied with the infrastructure that our code produces? Is it easy to pick up and use? Does it cover their requirements? I've realized that a good way to ensure these things are in place is if we have examples that demonstrate to our user how to implement the infrastructure as well as tests to ensure that the examples actually work. Is the infrastructure dependable and repeatable? Does it do what it says on the tin? How does the customer know it's true? Well, testing is proof. Is the infrastructure secure and compliant? Well, there are many ways to test this, and in most enterprises, several places where this kind of testing gets done. Um, but we can add tests to our code as well to help ensure that it is secure and compliant with our organization policies. Testing also helps us make quicker and safer changes. We can prevent breaking old code when we need to make changes. And also, if we have sufficient tests that cover our requirements, then those tests must, of course, pass. And finally, testing can only be avoided but not prevented. If you don't test it ahead of time, then it hopefully will eventually be tested in production when a user uses it. So wouldn't you rather test it beforehand? So why don't we test? Uh, we know of good reasons to test, but why don't we do it? Firstly, there seems to be a high barrier to entry. You perhaps have no idea how to get started testing. This talk should help with a starting point. Developing tests also does take time and effort. How do we know that the effort is worth it compared to working on something else? Testing can be a bit of a bottomless pit. It is almost impossible to test everything. If our tests help us find bugs before code gets to production, then the test is valuable. This is because if something breaks in production, it comes with significantly more effort to rectify the problem versus fixing it in a test environment. And there is a perception that we need to test everything for it to be worth it. Well, actually, we can decide in advance what is most important to test. Surely something is better than nothing. If we decide to set up a clear, repeatable approach or framework for tests, then the development effort is a lot lower each time we reuse our process. And for other developers that begin to adopt the approach, it's also easy for them as it's only one thing to learn. And finally, the code changes can be done more quickly in future because you have a set of tests that cover existing functionality and adding a new test to the existing framework should be quick. So I think that gives us some food for thought on the value of testing. Let's continue. So in this talk, we'll be using an example use case. We've been asked to develop some Terraform modules, including two modules listed on this slide, Terraform AWS S3 bucket for creating an S3 bucket, and Terraform AWS S3 bucket replication for replicating data between two buckets. This sounds simple, and well, it intentionally is, but you can already imagine how customer expectations could make this a challenge. The modules need to be easy to use, the customer wants to be able to copy paste code and have working deployments. The modules need to work and work in the organization's unique environment. The infrastructure needs to be secure according to organization policy, least privileged access. The replication needs to work in the same account, same region, but also cross region and cross account with a single module. It needs to be easy to maintain the code and avoid new fixes or features from breaking customer functionality. So bearing in mind our objectives, 
let's identify what tests are the most valuable. Here I started putting our tests into different categories, things that we won't test, things that we will test, and things we probably should test, but we're not going to. So the won't test is things that we can take for granted, where testing them would have a high cost and a low benefit. For example, things that either AWS or Terraform or the Terraform AWS provider should always provide for us. The things that we will test are things that have a high benefit to testing and a low cost to implement. For example, the core functionality that users would depend on in our module, the usability and the documentation side, or testing that security best practices are being followed. And we can also add some tests for standards so that we can easily reuse what we do. Then the category of things we should test are things that have a benefit to us, but a high cost of testing. These are things that we won't test yet. Maybe we can get to them later. If we review the list of will test, then we realize we need two main components. The first would be working examples, examples that we can deploy into an actual environment. We can test S3 replication in its various forms, and we want to test that our code will work with the Terraform versions that we have in our organization. And the second component is static code analysis. We can scan our code for problems and remedy them before anybody else even views our code. So this slide is just to summarize the weapons of choice we will be using for testing our Terraform modules. Soon we're going to dive into each tool in more detail. For the working examples part, we'll use Python and Terraform, uh, along with the Python libraries PyTest and TFTest. For static code analysis, we'll talk a bit about using pre-commit and Terraform, as well as tflint, Terraform docs, Chekhov, and tfsec for static code analysis. And finally, we'll need a way to automate our tests and ensure that they run with each change. For this, we'll use GitHub workflows. GitHub workflows will execute the tests above and also run a Terraform min or max version check, so we don't have to do that elsewhere. Oops, there we go. So we're almost ready to look at some code. Uh, let's briefly touch on why we chose to use Python to test our examples. So why Python? It's a commonplace industry tool. It's easy to pick up and learn. There is a large ecosystem of libraries to pull in and use for testing anything we want. The AWS Python client is mature and well-documented, so it should be easy for us to get off the ground. Python is very flexible and not strict about types. We can write tests without worrying about being efficient, type strict, etc. Whatever is the easiest hack to get the test to work. Uh, Python is also available on most platforms. We will specifically make use of two Python testing libraries, PyTest and TFTest. PyTest, as you can see on the slide, is a full featured Python testing framework to execute our tests. And TFTest is another Python library that can wrap the Terraform executable and expose convenience methods that we can actually use in our tests. Let's now walk through how the tests work by reviewing our Terraform AWS S3 bucket module. Our module has an examples folder, which contains all of our examples. Terraform module registries also look for this folder and provide a link to the examples in the UI if they are present. Each example will be in its own subfolder. For the S3 bucket module, we have just a single example, but for the S3 replication module, we will see several examples. So let's open our basic example. The example itself is actually self-documenting. You can see we've generated a readme file and we use Terraform docs to do this. The readme file contains some of the source code. This draws attention to important code without requiring the user to sift through various Terraform files and without requiring us as the engineers uh, to maintain this. You'll see at the top of the example is a bit of boilerplate code for generating the resource names and any other supporting resources that might be required for the module to work. And then there is a section for the actual example of the module showing an implementation of it. The idea is the user can easily understand this code, copy paste it and make minimal changes and it should work in their environment. But it also helps us for testing. Notice that in the example module, the source parameter is set to point to the actual source code 
rather than to a fixed version. So this is for two reasons. Firstly, the user must explicitly provide a version rather than us having to maintain a version number here as we release new versions of our module. And secondly, we can test this example actually works with the source code we have by running Terraform in this directory as the working directory. If we do make any changes to the module source code, then we could come here, do Terraform apply, and test the infrastructure manually if we wanted to. This testable examples is a very powerful approach. We use an example both as the interface to our user and as something that is tested to ensure it actually works. A user can therefore trust that using the example will provide an expected result. And we can deploy and eventually test the examples, which ensures they are up to date and there is no regression in functionality. Now let's get to the exciting part. How will we actually test this code using Python rather than just running Terraform commands against this working directory? So in our module, you'll notice we also have a test subdirectory and all of our Python tests will sit in here. So let's open our only unit test file. They all start with test underscore and in this case, there's only one. This will be for testing our basic example. This code has two parts. They are test fixtures and the actual tests themselves. Test fixtures are useful for preparing for tests. They provide a fixed baseline so that test functions can execute reliably and produce consistent repeatable results. The test functions are the individual unit tests that we want to run. Test functions can also use other functions and they can use test fixtures. Now, ideally when we write a test function, it should test a specific small part of our code so that if a test fails, we can easily tell what went wrong. However, we know that doing a Terraform apply and destroy for each individual test would be inefficient. We need an ability to do an apply and destroy before and after a set of tests, sort of like a wrapper around a group of tests. This is where test fixtures and fixture scopes are extremely useful. We can define a fixture so that we create infrastructure once for all our tests or once per Python file in this case, or once per test function if we really want to. So here we define a fixture that instructs Python to use the Terraform code in the examples slash basic directory and reuse that configuration for all subsequent tests. The fixture is defined with a module scope, which in Python's language means just for this file. So the infrastructure will be created once and destroyed once, regardless of how many unit tests we have in the file. Now let's review the individual test functions to see what is being tested. Firstly, there is a basic test that Terraform can actually create and destroy a module. It tests that Terraform apply must have run successfully. This test is probably not compulsory as the other tests imply that this one will also pass. Secondly, there is a basic test that we did indeed create an S3 bucket. Third, there is a more detailed test that the S3 bucket encryption is configured correctly using a KMS key and that bucket key is enabled on the bucket. This reduces cost per our organization requirements. And the fourth test is a test that the bucket policy is correct per our organization requirements. Let's now do a small deep dive into the test for the bucket policy. You'll notice that this test function accepts an argument called output. This is actually automatically provided to the function when the tests are run because the name of the parameter matches the name of our fixture above. Okay, I'm just scrolling down, there we go. So our fixture runs, it creates Terraform infrastructure via Terraform apply, and then it runs uh, Terraform output and imports that data into Python and places that set of Terraform outputs into the output variable when calling our function. Remember, the fixture will only run once as sort of a wrapper over all the tests in this file. So only once all the tests are done, whether successful or failed, will the Terraform destroy be executed. Inside the test function, you'll see that we can refer to the Terraform outputs and then use them for testing. For example, we can read the bucket name and we can read the apparent bucket policy. The reason I called it apparent bucket policy is because the module is producing this output, but how do we know it is a bucket policy 
and not just some JSON document or some other artifact? How do we know that it was actually attached to the bucket? What if someone changes it in future and the new policy breaks our organization or compliance requirements? So this test verifies that our policy is indeed compliant. And towards the end, you will see over here that we do an API call to AWS to prove that indeed the policy is attached and correct. Now, this is still a very simple test, but let's briefly compare, compare it to one of the tests in the S3 replication module. Here is our S3 replication module. You'll note that it has a very similar structure to our S3 bucket module. And indeed, we can reuse the structure and this approach on any number of modules we wish to create. Now, if you have ever had to set up S3 replication before, you would know that it is an error-prone task to find the least privileged policies needed whilst also ensuring you can support cross-region or cross-account replication with buckets that may or may not be encrypted, for example. Now, imagine manually testing that you didn't break something when updating your module to cater for each of these requirements. So instead, you can write tests that check if you can add a file to a source bucket, wait for it to replicate, and verify that it arrived at the destination. So here are some of the example Terraform code that shows our user how to implement each scenario. They could simply go into the example, copy paste and configure the code, and it would behave as they expect. We also have, of course, tests that cover each of the modules, therefore running the Terraform apply and destroy on them and allowing us to test functionality. For S3 bucket replication, if we look at the test file, we can see that it has some functionality for creating objects in a source bucket, waiting for them to appear on the destination side and verifying that the replication completed successfully. So we can write Terraform examples that show our user how to deploy the module for each scenario, whether it's cross-region, cross-account, etc. We can cover it with tests and now you and your user can trust that the code works and any problems are possibly something in the customer environment and not a bug in the replication policies or in the infrastructure. So the user copy pastes an example and they can be sure that it works. In other words, it is tested to meet both their and their organization's wider requirements. Now I'd also like to show you conftest.py, which is a file that is also part of the testing puzzle. You'll see it in the tests subdirectory. So conftest.py can have several purposes. For example, importing external plugins, creating functions and fixtures that will be used by all tests, or automatically signaling to PyTest that there are actually tests in the directory where conftest resides. For example, here we use it to import the TF test Python library, and also to create some functions that map our Terraform example directory to a Python test that we want to execute. That part is over here. You'll see that two search paths are being set up. One is for finding Terraform examples in our examples folder that we've seen. And another search path is where we can place additional Terraform test code that maybe we don't want the user to see that it shouldn't be listed in our examples. The additional Terraform tests could be useful if we want to test sub-modules or specific edge cases, that if they were included as examples, they would clutter and detract from the working examples the user is actually interested in. In this file, I'll also highlight the get tf function over here, which sets up the tf test library to execute Terraform against the relevant code, such as the, configuring the working directory to be where the examples are. There's a lot of boilerplate code here that would clutter our unit tests. Putting the common functions here means that we can also copy paste this conf test file to other modules and reuse our testing approach. Eventually, we could put this boilerplate code into our own Python library and just import it. Lastly, there are two helper functions which we reuse in our tests. The first is Terraform plan, which runs a Terraform plan and returns the plan output to be tested. This means we could test that a plan is valid without actually doing an apply and destroy. 
The second function, Terraform Apply and Output, runs Terraform Apply and then runs Terraform Output, which is a little bit different to a plan output. It then also makes sure that Terraform Destroy is once is Terraform Destroy is run once the tests are completed and even if they fail. At this point, we can actually just run PyTest in our local development environment and it will execute our tests, creating our infrastructure and running the tests against it, destroying it when it's done. So over here is our wonderful IDE and we are going to do a live demo and hopefully it will work. <laughs> so in our uh, Terraform AWS S3 bucket repository, we can simply run PyTest and provided that we have authenticated with AWS and configured our environment correctly, uh, PyTest will begin executing all of our tests. In this case, there's only one. The first thing it will do is do our Terraform apply, and then it will iterate across our four tests for this module. And finally, it will do Terraform destroy. So that is what it is busy doing at the moment. While we wait for that to execute, we can move on and jump back to it because it will take some time. But I can just point out it is actually doing something because in our examples basic folder, we can see some Terraform files have popped up. Remember, this is the working directory when our test is actually running. On this slide, you can see how to set up your Python environment so that you can actually run these tests. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but the steps are here if anyone would like to, to use them or anyone is not familiar with how to set up a Python environment. Okay. Let's now discuss remote automation with GitHub workflows. We know that we can run our tests locally using PyTest, but what if we forget to run the tests? Or what if another developer is contributing a change? How do we know that the tests have passed? Well, we can use GitHub workflows to execute our PyTest command, for example. Then whenever there is a new pull request, we can run the tests against it and see the test output in GitHub. Specifically, we use GitHub workflows to test the following things. Firstly, ensure that our pre-commit checks, which we'll get to in a moment, and our Python tests are executed. This is using our pre-commit and tests YAML file. Secondly, we can test that specified minimum and maximum ver Terraform versions work, and we have a workflow file for this. These YAML files are stored in our repository in the GitHub workflows directory, and they'll be executed by GitHub on each pull request. Let's review a sample pull request now. I can just find my browser. There we go. So here is a sample pull request that was closed some time ago. Um, if we go to view details, we'll see all the different checks that have run against this pull request. And if we go to the checks tab, we also get a bit of a summary or overview of what has actually run. If we click on pre-commit and tests workflow, we'll see the specific um, steps or jobs that have executed. And unfortunately, because this pull request is a month old now, the logs have been deleted, as you'll see if I click on them. But luckily, I have a slide for that. So in the slide, you can see a screenshot of the that the Python tests actually completed for this uh, pull request in GitHub. Um, and this pull request was for the S3 bucket replication module. So you'll notice in the slide that there are actually three uh, uh, tests that were run uh, for this particular module. The examples basic, the cross region example, and the multiple destinations example. So on GitHub, it's quite easy to see on the pull request that our Python tests and our Terraform code is actually working before we merge our code. Okay, we should have about 10 minutes left in our talk. Yes, we do. So for the remaining time, I'll talk about testing via static code analysis using pre-commit. So what is pre-commit? Pre-commit is a multi-language package manager for pre-commit hooks. You specify a list of hooks you want and pre-commit will manage the installation and execution of any hook written in any language before each commit. 
So when you attempt to do a git commit, git will execute your installed pre-commit hooks. The commit is only applied if all of the pre-commit hooks are successful. So why is this useful? Firstly, it is language agnostic. This is great because Terraform repos can contain a variety of code, some Terraform files, some YAML, some Python, some shell scripts, for example. Pre-commit gives you a single place to define the static checks for all the code in your repository. Secondly, there is a huge set of hooks created by the community, which allow you to get best practices in your repo by simply picking from and configuring the community hooks. Pre-commit is a package manager, and it can fetch and install the hooks automatically. You just need to specify the hooks you want. Generally, because pre-commit runs locally and before every commit, we can use it to do lightweight testing where there is no dependencies on external environments. For example, I use it to format code for all the different scripts. It can fix up formatting for us. Pre-commit can ensure that our documentation is generated automatically and included with our code changes. Pre-commit can help us to check and prevent common mistakes like large files being added to a repo or worse, credentials like passwords, tokens, private keys from being added. And pre-commit can help us uh, not commit to a protected branch like a main branch or master um, instead of committing to a feature branch. And of course, pre-commit can always be disabled or skipped entirely if required. Now, we can't guarantee that every developer will install and use pre-commit when making changes. So we need to run it remotely as part of our GitHub workflow to make sure that the checks indeed do pass. It can especially become a challenge if developers work on many different repositories that use different versions of the binaries, or if the developers use different operating systems. Fortunately, you can always skip the pre-commit checks locally and then require them to run in your GitHub workflow where your environment can be created consistently. Let's briefly look at the pre-commit file in our repo. And remember that this file can be reused on all your different modules, just with minor changes in configuration to suit the particular module that you're working on. So here is our pre-commit YAML file. If we wish to run the checks manually, we can um, by simply typing uh, pre-commit. Let me just move our window so that I can see it. See our command line here. One moment. There we go. Now we can see over here. Pre-commit run dash A, which will run all of our pre-commit hooks on demand. However, we can also do pre-commit install to make sure that the checks run on every commit. As you can see from reviewing this file, we have various uh, static uh, checks that pre-commit does, and it does a bit more than that as well. We use it for generating our Terraform documentation. So here is what we use for generating the readmes for the example files. We also have Terraform format, Terraform validate that we run, um, Terraform lint, and then tfsec and checkov, which we'll talk about just now. We also have various hooks covering Python formatting, because we know we have Python tests, so we should format them nicely and validate them. And any shell scripts that we might have in our repo can also be tested and checked. And finally, some general hooks that check for silly mistakes, large files, credentials, and so on. You can go through the list of hooks yourself and pick and choose which ones you like, as I mentioned. You can see that our pre-commit um, actually failed in this case. Most of the checks passed. The one that failed is the do not commit to branch check because I'm currently on our develop branch, which is a protected branch. So pre-commit is doing its job. Okay, let's talk a little bit about static code analysis with Chekhov. So Chekhov uh, scans cloud infrastructure configurations to find misconfigurations before they're deployed. Here is a brief example of, um, of Chekhov uh, running against our S3 bucket module. And in this case, Chekhov helped us to consider S3 bucket logging um, as well as replication and other checks that we might not even have considered when developing our S3 bucket module. 
So tools like these are super helpful for sort of identifying other configuration and security issues and other potential misconfigurations that might not be apparent when you're developing your module. Another benefit of Chekhov is that it actually covers more than just Terraform code. So the other scripts in your libraries can, the other scripts in your repo can also potentially be checked. Here is an example of how we might rectify a finding from Chekhov. So in this case, we enabled bucket logging by creating a resource because that's important for our organization. And in other case, in other cases, maybe we choose to skip specific checks because it's actually irrelevant for what we're trying to do. So all of these things can be configured in code and it's relatively easy to see what's going on. We also make use of TFSEC. So TFSEC is a static analysis security scanner for your Terraform code. Why do we also use TFSEC as well as Chekhov? Well, why not, right? More checks are always good. And TFSEC tends to do a bit more in-depth security scanning of our code, whereas Chekhov has a bunch of different checks that it can run. So here's an example of using TFSEC and it picked up a finding on our code. And in this case, um, there was an issue that our KMS key does not have rotation enabled. Um, there's a nice description of what's the impact as well as some links to information and how to rectify this. In this case, we opt to skip this check because the place where we create our KMS key is actually in our example. And we don't really mind that it's not going to be rotated because we're going to use it just for testing. We spin it up and spin it down and it's not really used for anything, but maybe it's important to you. So here's perhaps some examples of where you can configure TFSEC. There's a configuration file to add exclusions as well as you can add comments in the code for certain checks to be skipped. And that's it from me today. So thank you very much for attending this talk. This is a brief summary of what we discussed and links to the source code if you wish to review it. There's obviously a lot more to testing in general, but I hope this talk has shown you how to implement most of what you might practically need. If there are any questions, I'll be available in the chat for a little while afterwards. Thank you.